We'll uh, kind of stretch out the uh, intro a little bit to give uh, people time to sit down, but thought we might as well get started here. Um, we're from Princess Cruises. We're going to do a little talk here about uh, Drupal at Sea, how we're using Drupal on board our ships, uh, which is kind of a cool, interesting, weird use case for Drupal. Um, so this is Subu, um, and I am Nate, and we're two of the project leads for Princess at Sea, which is our guest-facing uh, experience app uh, on board the ships. Uh, our <coughs> Twitter handles are down there at the bottom, so feel free to add us. We love talking to people and sharing you know, helpful tips we've had and so on. Um, so a little bit of history about Princess, uh, kind of put in context what the environment we're working on. Um, this is our 50th anniversary this year. Uh, we were founded in uh, 1965. We have 18 cruise ships operating around the world, and we uh, carry over 1.7 million uh, guests each year. So a lot of people actually will know us uh, as the love boat. <laughs> Sabu always gets upset when I do that, so I always do it. He has to do that all um, the time. <laughs> It was uh, you know, a pretty popular show that ran from 1977 to 1987. Um, we actually incorporated that into our 50th anniversary celebration this year. Uh, had actually a lot of the cast come out and do the uh, christening and naming ceremony of uh, Regal Princess, our newest ship. Um, so to kind of give you a little idea of what these ships are like uh, and the kind of size of the infrastructure that we work with, um, Royal Princess was uh, the first ship we deployed our application on in 2013. Um, it itself took three million man hours to construct. Um, it's made of 37,000 tons of steel. It has almost 2,500 miles of electrical cable uh, running throughout the ship. Uh, to paint it that wonderful white color it takes 95,000 gallons of paint and it has a 14-ton anchor. Um, and to give you a little idea of the scale of the uh, brand in total, uh, every month at Princess, we serve 14 million slices of pizza on board the ships, um, a million and a half gallons of soda pop, one million cookies, which I've definitely added to that number, uh, and this is kind of a frightening one. Out of the one million cookies, only 120,000 bananas were served, too. So you can see where people's priorities are when they're on board. Um, and enough ice cream to fill an Olympic-sized pool, um, which is kind of a lot when you think about it. So what are we doing with Drupal? So I'm going to show a little video here. This is actually made by uh, Acquia uh, with us to kind of promote what we were doing uh, on board the ship and how we're using uh, Drupal overall. So two minutes long, gives you a good introduction. At Princess, we pride ourselves on being the destination experts. We strive for creating a meaningful passenger experience. The company has been in business for, for many years. In fact, in 2015, it will be our 50th uh, anniversary. We have a fleet of 18 ships delivering an incredible product to our passengers every single day. Our ships are getting bigger and more complex. Princess at Sea really has kind of fundamentally changed the way the passenger can find information on the ship. When they get on board and they're looking at this application, it has to show them everything from events to itineraries. I mean, Princess at Sea is the hub of everything they're doing on board. The ability to have a reliable technology delivery platform for us is key. And Drupal really allowed us to do that. Using Drupal as a base, we've been able to basically deploy the app, and then we can continue building on that for the future. Whenever there was a new idea being floated out by the team, there was almost already the answer packaged somewhere within the community. I believe we wouldn't be able to do this without the support of Drupal community. Every passenger-facing screen on the ship is connected to Princess Sea and therefore Drupal. And we kind of want to create a customized experience. So when you get on board the ship and you open our application, you, you know you aren't seeing the same thing as everybody else. If, if you're a foodie, you're seeing events that are more specific to, to kind of your interests, and that way it creates a, a unique experience for every cruise passenger. 
Open source definitely gave us the opportunity to move a lot faster on our project. We can roll out to any ship within a month's time, which is really great. One of the things that really excites me about this project is that we have a real opportunity to you know, improve the passenger experience overall, from the moment they book to after they get off the ship, and have that experience be a memorable one for the rest of their lives. So there we go. That's what we're doing with Drupal. Thank you very much. Let's see. No. Um, so the the application um, it, it is Prince Let's See. That's the name of it. We'll go into a little bit more detail about it over the course of this presentation. Um, but we've deployed now onto uh, eleven ships. Next week, uh, actually tomorrow, Davis, who's sitting right over there, flies uh, out to Hong Kong to uh, install it on Sun Princess. I think right, Sun. Yeah. Uh, so that'll be number 12. We'll be on the rest of the fleet by the end of the year. Um, and like we've kind of said already, Drupal really powers our guest experience platform that we're building out on the ships. Um, so what is Princess at Sea? You know, it's, it's many things. Um, it's uh, a way for the passenger to experience the events on board and see the events and the schedule of events and all that stuff. A way for the passenger to look at their bill at any time. Um, during the course of the voyage. It is a multilingual uh, experience for the passengers. Um, some of our friends from Lingotech are here right now, and um, they definitely have been a key part of making this happen for us. Um, we'll talk a little bit in more detail about that later on, but uh, it's a key component for us. And our newest thing, which is actually something that wouldn't have been possible without this platform on board, is uh, messaging, and allowing passenger-to-passenger -passenger messaging for free. So before we get too far into the details of what Prince at Sea is, every story has a backstory. Um, so we're going to look back a little bit and talk about how we got to where we are. So we started um, with Drupal in 2007, Drupal 5, uh, building a uh, shipboard crew intranet. Um, it was a success because uh, Drupal really was a platform that allowed our crew members to collaborate with each other, ship to ship. Um, it can be kind of a uh, solitary experience when you're on a ship, you're kind of cut off from the rest of the world and your channels of communication are actually very limited. So they really like the fact that they could post things to their friends uh, on different contracts on different ships. Um, based on that success, uh, we then rebuilt the entire corporate intranet, which was both ship and shore side. Uh, and merged it all into one uh, for portholes. Um, it was uh, really an extension of what we had done with uh, cruise connections uh, and taking all this stuff that we had in an old content management system shoreside and merging that into connections. And based on those successes, uh, in 2012, uh, Princess was getting ready to do the final uh, steps in uh, uh, the build and rollout of our newest ship, Royal Princess, and uh, they wanted to have an interactive guest experience platform on board. Um, so they sent it to our team because we were able to build out these things uh, with Drupal very quickly and effectively. So at the time, uh, we thought we were building kind of a responsive website um, that would allow the passenger to view their bill and their events uh, in a mobile phone. Um, so we really thought we were just building a website. Um, but as we started looking at what Princess at Sea actually was and started looking at all the different areas of content, uh, the different business units, um, the different content workflows and curation that we would have, uh, I added onto that uh, looking at the different systems that Drupal on board would be tying into, uh, like video on demand or digital signage, uh, the printed newsletter, all of these things, we uh, kind of started suspecting that we were building something more, more than just a website. And then something interesting happened. Uh, we went to DrupalCon Portland while we were in development. It was actually in a break between when we were out at the shipyard, uh, looking at the ship um, and installing things on the ship. Um, and we saw two keynotes there. One was Dree's keynote that year. 
Uh, highly recommend going back and watching it. Uh, it's really interesting looking at it two years later. Uh, the key thing for us was really it defined what we were trying to achieve. Uh, he talks a lot in that key, uh, keynote about digital and being digital and Drupal being digital. And the other keynote we saw that really changed our perspective uh, was from Karen McGrain. Again, highly recommend watching that, it's awesome. Um, but really what we took away from that was this whole idea of separating content from presentation, uh, doing COPE, that's what we were already starting down the path for that. Um, so we had kind of an aha moment. And that was that we should have a slide full of cats. Um, but really we did have like an aha moment at this point. Um, we had a new perspective on what we were doing in building. Um, and that was that what we were building was really in the center of all of these different pieces of uh, technology on board, that we were touching uh, the VOD system or kiosks, uh, the mobile phones, tablets, desktops, the printed newsletter and all of that, and that uh, Drupal was gonna be the center, at the center of all this, and maintaining content for all of this stuff. So we realized something that what we were actually doing was causing a digital transformation uh, on board the ship. Um, and what is digital transformation? Uh, that is, and I'm gonna read this directly because it's a pretty good quote. The process of shifting your organization from a legacy approach, and that can be technology or just business processes, uh, to new ways of working and thinking about digital, social media, mobile, and all these emerging technologies. So what it really breaks down to is kind of three key areas, uh, transforming operational processes, transforming business models, and transforming customer experiences. Uh, and we really knew we were doing that already, so we decided to really embrace that uh, and make it a core part of what we were doing. So transfor transformation of this nature is you know, more than just a technology or set of tools. Um, you know, you have to start challenging some of your own assumptions. And one of the assumptions that we had was, you know, what were we actually building? Uh, and as a note, we're going to show a lot of these kind of behind the scenes slides, so I'll kind of say what they are. Uh, this was actually Regal Princess being built in uh, Monfalcone, Italy. Uh, it was taken from Royal Princess as we were leaving the shipyard. Um, so this is about a year out from uh, its inaugural. So when we talked about transforming our thinking, and this is kind of why this slide works for us here, is that you know, we were building a platform and not just a product, a project. You know, we were laying the foundation uh, for that end user experience that was gonna connect to all of these different things. Um, and we were responsible for that end user experience. So once you've done that, you've transformed the, the idea of what you're building that has big ramifications. Um, and this shot here is from on Royal Princess during its voyage from the shipyard to Southampton for its naming ceremony. And what you see here is basically as much of the crew that could be packed into the open decks as possible. It's all sorts of people. There's senior staff members, there's accommodations, there's cooks and... Uh, tech and all that kind of stuff. So that's the next step we had to do is kind of transform our idea of what the team was. You know, we were building something that would uh, benefit the passenger and would have, um, uh, that we would be involved in from end to end, from concept to delivery. And uh, so, when you look at this, these are the people that are actually delivering the product to the passenger, that are actually giving them the vacation experience. And we were having to ex expand the scope of who we consider part of the, the project team or the pro uh, platform team, uh, all the way from us working on these initial wireframes and coming up with ideas, all the way to these people actually interacting with the passenger day to day and helping them use the application and getting feedback from them and really bringing them into the process. Oh, and one more note on that slide before I move on, but you know, part of that is, especially with Drupal, is that 
these people are also the people that are going to make this product successful, the project, the platform, successful in the end, because they are the ones who are going to be maintaining the content on board um, and maintaining the ship site. So without them uh, being actively involved and engaged, uh, the project itself could fail. So this slide here is the data center slash uh, broadcast center on Regal Princess. Um, they've got all the different satellite channels coming in. They can monitor. There's a whole other bank of screens where they have monitoring for all the servers and all that stuff. So when you're dealing with, you know, uh, a large distributed team like this, you also have to, like, think about how you're going to transform your communication strategy, um, you know, and figure out ways you're going to be agile with the distributed team. Um, and we do that. You'll, we sat in a couple of presentations yesterday, and you see the same kind of tools everywhere, you know, JIRA, Confluence for documentation, Slack or HipChat for instant communication and other tools. Slack works awesome for us when we're doing deployments. We can have a constant stream of what's going on on board. Um, when we're dealing with our offshore teams or working with people in other locations, screen sharing, go to meeting, WebEx, whatever, it's very critical. Okay, so this one is, unfortunately he had to go home early, but this is a guy from our team, Jerry. Uh, he's on Royal Princess here, doing the last 1% of a deployment for something. He's actually testing card swipes, and he's in a hard hat because this is actually a construction zone at this point. Um, there's people welding stuff, painting stuff, sanding stuff, all that on the ship at this point. And we like this slide a lot because, you know, the idea here is that you're transforming how you execute on the product or the project and, the, and deliver features and this is definitely something you wouldn't expect to be doing if you were just building software. You know, he's physically out on the ship testing uh, the equipment. And this is where really like Drupal really starts coming into play for us. Um, we're able to build stuff out very quickly early on, show it to our business uh, very quickly get their okay on it, and then take it from a proof of concept all the way to the, the final feature that's going to be delivered. Um, messaging was one of those that started out that way. It was uh, a test of some modules. Um, ratings and reviews is kind of coming up that way too. Um, App Dynamics, we're using that to monitor and see the performance of our servers, see where we may be having issues, automatically correct stuff, uh, stash for code sharing, BHAT for feature testing, um, and of course we're moving into AngularJS right now as well. So this photo here is Regal Princess off the coast of Italy somewhere probably um, in a tender port. So we'll come back to this in a moment, but look at the scale here. Um, what you see over on the left-hand side is a tender boat uh, actually coming up to dock with the ship and exchange passengers in and passengers out. Um, so if you think about this right here, it's a gigantic ship. It's too big to even fit on screen. You have this tiny little tender port, uh, boat coming up, and that's the conduit of people getting in and on and off the ship uh, when we're anchored like this. So, you know, transforming the way you deliver. And in this case, we like this because it talks about the constraints that we have, this image, um, that we have a ship out at sea and we have to figure out how to, that we can be flexible, fast, execute things consistently. Um, we use tools like SaltStack for uh, configuration management. Um, of course, Drupal is a key part here. We uh, basically make the assumption that we're not going to be able to physically do anything human cannot interact with the server on board the ship. It all has to be automated. So we leverage things like features and um, migrate, drush heavily uh, for making backups and being able to recover if a deploy goes wrong. Um, we're actively looking at Docker right now uh, to more standardize our uh, environment on board and make it more flexible than it is now. Um, like I said before, we use Drush heavily. It's throughout our entire deployment pipeline. Uh, there's a lot of really cool features. We also use it as a means of feature flagging, too, so that we can build uh, new features in modules, 
have them on in certain environments and off in others. Uh, so when we're ready to activate a brand new feature on board the ship, we can just include that as part of our deploy and Drush handles the actual activation of that thing for us. It's really pretty cool. Jenkins actually, you know, of course, manages all the actual orchestration pieces there. And we heavily use Vagrant uh, on our local, local boxes. Uh, one thing to note here is we actually run Jenkins and SaltStack on board the ship. Just because in case some of the uh, deployment fails, we have uh, auto rolled back to the previous known, uh, known uh, good version. Because we probably may not even able to connect to the ship and then debug, so it has to auto roll back and self heal. So that's that's one point to note here. Yeah, that's a real critical point too. Because uh, and we'll go into it in a second. Actually, it's a really good uh, time to bring this up because that's actually one of our biggest constraints. And th this photo is a nice lead in because our biggest constraint really is that we have, you know. A shore side master repository of all corporate approved content in Drupal. Uh, and then we have all these 18 other Drupal instances running out there. Uh, and the thing that constrains actually our communication there is the satellite connectivity. Um, much like the tender boat and the uh, dock there on the uh, being able to dock onto the ship is uh, a limiting factor on how many people you can get on and off the ship at once. The, Satellite is really a limiting factor in how much data we can send back and forth. And it's also not something we can always count on being there. So if we start a deployment, the satellite goes down, we have to have contingency plans to handle that automatically for us. Uh, especially if the code got out there fine, Jenkins starts this process, the satellite goes down, it's got to be able to not kill the entire system if something goes awry. So this photo here, this is what they call the bulbous. It's on top of the ship. It's what covers all the uh, radio, the satellite equipment, the radio equipment, all that stuff. There's actually multiple of these. Uh, they have different purposes uh, for different, they carry different kinds of equipment packages. Um, but that's where we got, had to kind of go to, is what does the content life cycle look like when we have a shoreside master kind of uh, controlling the majority of the content? We have these. Um, individual ship-based sites out there uh, that are handling their own publishing but have to rely on this one and changes that happen on there that we want to bring back and then reincorporate into the, uh, the, uh, the, the, that master shoreside system. Um, it's, uh, it's a really tricky thing. It's kind of um, something that's probably way too big to go into in this presentation, but um, Come by, we have a booth, so swing by. We'd love to talk about it if you have any questions about that. Because um, it is pretty cool, I think, what we've been able to do there. And this is kind of where that Kira McGrain's um, keynote really hit us. And, and the way that the content is really structured is that we are actively supporting multiple different endpoints with this system. Um, so it has to be reusable. Content is reusable everywhere. Um, the ship actually has really embraced, the ships have really embraced this because when you talk about what events, titles, descriptions, images all look like, it's a tremendous amount of work for a ship to, to manage this library of potentially thousands of unique titles, descriptions, all that stuff for the event listing. And uh, we've been able to now leverage all the ships together to create this like community uh, uh, maintained and curated library of events. So they all can add ones to it. It may not make its way back into the master one, uh, but it has uh, a workflow where it comes back shoreside. They can review it, edit it, update the one on the ship, and then redeploy it out to all the other ships. Uh, so ultimately reusable. And that content type, or I mean that taxonomy type, actually has uh, multiple other use of cases for it too. So there's uh, a field for the newsletter version of that event description. There's image uh, upload areas for digital signage and for uh, use on Princess at Sea. So uh, we can reuse that one image uh, or that one scheduled event to, to publish out to all of these different endpoints. And this is, uh, like I said, a key one. We'll show some examples of this in a moment. Um, 
but multi-language is, is one thing we always have to keep in mind. Um, it's, if you haven't done multiple languages yet, um, be prepared to underestimate the amount of effort that it's going to take to, to do. Um, it's a very challenging topic, a uh, very challenging subject, a very challenging way, uh, thing to do right. Uh, I don't think we've done it totally right, but I think we've done it 95% right. Um, it is key for us. We, we're, you know, we're an uh, international brand. Uh, we're in China now. Uh, we sail through Europe throughout the summer, so there's, which used to be a heavily, uh, heavily uh, booked by North Americans. Now it's getting more heavily skewed towards Europeans actually booking. Uh, so we have to be able to support uh, and um, through our system, all these different languages. And this is a key thing too, we'll talk about in a second when I show it, uh, that, that has made a big difference that we couldn't have done without a digital platform like this. So a couple of the key things we use here, um, Lingotech, like I said, I can't talk enough about how you know, awesome the relationship has been with Lingotech. Um, they're a key partner for us. Uh, we're looking at further bulletproofing our content lifecycle with message queues like RabbitMQ or something along that way. Uh, and we heavily use, heavily, heavily use uh, Drupal to Drupal kind of migration using Migrate and uh, services. That's uh, something we couldn't do this project without. So we spent kind of a long time talking about, you know, digital transformation from operational and business side. Um, so now let's talk about the actual fun stuff to look at, which is transforming the customer experience. So this was kind of the first version of Princess at Sea that deployed on Royal Princess. Um, what, it, what Princess at Sea really does overall is uh, transform the way passengers interact with the ship, um, you know, experience their vacation, and communicate with each other. Um, we'll show kind of some little bits and pieces of that right now. So this here is actually Regal Princess, I think, uh, the front desk area it was a, as it was finalizing construction. Now before Princess at Sea, if a passenger wanted to view their bill, they'd have to go to the front desk, wait in a line, get a paper printout, or they could go to a kiosk, maybe wait in a line, uh, and get a paper printout, or wait till the end of the voyage, uh, get a paper printout of their bill. Uh, and those are kind of the three ways. Um, now, they can pretty much view this at any time uh, on their own device. Um, it's on demand. Um, they can go in, look at it at any point. It's up to date. It basically, I always go and buy a martini when we actually get it up and running so I can test to see if it, uh, you know, is actually billing me right. Um, that's just what I say to hide the fact that I like martinis. Um, this is where it gets kind of cool, though. Like, we, as we've rolled this out, like, the, the staff on board, we hear this from them anecdotally. We've seen it a little bit. Um, but it's definitely decreased the lines of people waiting for uh, this bill at the front desk. It's a, they actually have come up to us unasked and said, you know, this is great. This lets us focus on really... Um, helping passengers who may be having a real problem, not just wanting a printout of their bill. Um, and from a budget standpoint, it's great too, because now we have to print less junk out um, and don't have to spend as much money on paper and don't have to throw a whole bunch of paper away or incinerate it or whatever. Um, and one thing that this has also done is allow us to do kind of uniquely digital things. Um, like adding filter, a filter on the top so they can actually look at the different kinds of things they're spending on. Um, so they can kind of manage how much they want to spend and where, which different areas a little bit better. And it's really designed to be you know, simpler to understand and look at and all that stuff. Even though it does have dollar dollar sign tours and stuff like that on there. That's uh, the system that feeds us. That's the problem that we're working on right now actually. Okay, so there's a few of the modules we used to, to make this happen at the bottom. We'll have those on a few of these different slides. Um, 
So this photo here is from during Royal Princess inaugural. It's actually the upper deck on board the ship. We have kind of a, I think they call it watercolor fantasy or something like that. Um, but one note, all these photos Sabu and I took too. So if you think they're cool, let us know. And we'll feel good about ourselves. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, this is kind of some of the kinds of events that we have. We have, you know, it's, the ship is, you know, a hotel, it's a dining place, it's a mall, it's a bunch of entertainment, so it's all self-contained. So there's a ton of stuff to be doing on board all, at all times. You know, before Prince at Sea, really, like, uh, the passenger had to look at a printed newsletter every day, which is actually pretty dense with a lot of competing things, uh, ads, uh, venue hours, uh, the note from the captain, all this kind of stuff. Um, but after Princess Let's See, they're actually able to do quite a few cool things beyond just looking at the events, even though that's a key, you know, a key part of this, is being able to see these up-to-the-minute events. Sometimes event venues change, like what happened actually this morning when they had to announce a whole bunch of time changes for uh, different events that were happening here. Uh, we can just go in and change the time and so on on here, and it's updated immediately. Um, occasionally, uh, weather might be too bad, we can't go into port, so that means the entire day's events change like that. Before, uh, they would have to actually go print a whole new run of the uh, Princess Patter, which is our newsletter, uh, to, 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 to let people know what the new events are going to be on board that day. Now they can just go in and do it immediately. So we're able to show more detail than we could in the, uh, the printed version of the newsletter. We're able to show deck plans, where the thing is, let them slide around, look, get more detail about this stuff. Uh, some of the other cool things we can do now that we have this kind of a platform out there is we're able to now extend this concept of an event to passengers themselves. So they're able to actually go in create events that only they or the people they invite can see. So that also implies they can event, share these events. And more than implies that it actually allows them to do that. They're able to create an event saying, let's go meet uh, for dinner at Sabatini's at 8 p.m., uh, share it to the people in their group, and now they all have it in their personalized schedule to go see. And for us, one of the things that is a benefit both to the passenger and princess is that the passenger can flag events that they intend to go see, uh, create their kind of own personalized schedule. Uh, and then what we get as a company, which is awesome, is now we can see how, what, is, what are the events passengers are planning to attend. Um, and do we need to change maybe uh, the amount of crew members that are employed at this event if it's much more popular than we think it's going to be. Um, so we can have more bar um, stewards out there um, making sure the passenger gets the kind of service they want. And here's kind of like the, what it looks like when um, you know, they, they, uh, they craft their own schedule. The homepage totally changes into their personalized schedule. Um, so this is a key one for events. What I'm going to show is not actually screenshots of events, but just general stuff. But um, this has been a huge one for us. Um, being able to display these events in multiple languages on demand by the passenger, powered by Drupal, and the Lingotech connection that we have. Um, but previously, we re really could only print multilingual uh, event listings on demand. Um, if we knew there were guests there, and if we had the proper people on board to be able to, um, to, to make sure that the language was correct, all that kind of stuff. Uh, now we can do this whenever. We're using the standardized library of titles and descriptions that are pre-translated. Um, the ship just has to pre select one of these pre-translated items, uh, and then now, magically, we have the entire event listing in whatever languages we support. Uh, currently, it is limited to Chinese and Japanese. We're launching Spanish later this month, and then we'll ultimately have nine languages available. Uh, French, German, Portuguese, Russian, and Italian. I can't remember all of them. Italian, that's I mean, right. The ships Simple. also have the freedom to create new events 
which may not be translated initially, but we have a workflow that's been created so that the events are getting migrated back to the show set instance, gets translated through Lingotech, and comes back to the ship when it's ready for showing to the passengers. <coughs> so this is kind of what Sapphire Princess looked like uh, over the summer last year. You know, we were able to leverage Drupal's, um, uh, you know, language detection on the device. So people that were coming to look at it in simplified Chinese would automatically get um, the version in Chinese. Um, I knew we must have done this right when I used these slides in presentations with native Chinese speakers and nobody started laughing at me for showing something crazy. Um, they actually, I kept asking, does this really say what I think it means, you know, what I think it says? And so, but this was really, this is a key feature for us. This was a huge thing for us to have in, uh, in China last year um, and Japan this year when we launched it on Diamond Princess a month and a half ago. Um, and I can't really, you know, I, I just can't talk enough about how great the working relationship with Lingotech is and there'll be a reason why uh, we can talk even further about this at the end that I'll show at the end of the presentation. Um, uh, here's kind of some of the modules we use. Don't worry about writing all this stuff down. Uh, it'll be up for viewing later. Um, so one interesting use case that we didn't even think about was the passengers uh, and crew talk using this for communication. So it, just in case a passenger is a non-native speaker and the crew doesn't know how to speak to this passenger in that language, and if the passenger is looking for something, they actually browse uh, to the location in English and then switch to the, switch the language and show the passenger. So this was used as a means of communication in which we never thought that would be used like that. Yeah, that was a cool one we heard on deployment. It was actually one of those things like, you know, just behaviors that start happening when tools like this are out there. Um, okay, so now we're gonna talk about one of the big challenges on board and one of the things that is actually unique to having a platform like this out there. Um, this is kind of a comedy photo we took on Coral Princess during our deployment. We had these speaker phones in the room and no, we could hear everybody else on the speaker, but nobody could hear us. We found the way to do it was take the handset up and speak right into the phone like it's a microphone. Um, so that leads us into kind of the, the big feature that we launched that's ro rolling out to all the ships right now, uh, messaging. Um, so when you're on a ship, it can be kind of hard to coordinate with all the other people you're traveling with. Um, there's not really, there's, you know, phone and voicemail and, and all that stuff, but that requires going to your stateroom, you know, checking your voicemail. Um, and who wants, to, you're not on the cruise to sit in your stateroom all the time checking your voicemail. That's what you do at home. Um, so to, to combat this, some passengers have gotten pretty creative. Uh, I think we talked with somebody earlier today who's planning or was planning to get walkie-talkies, you know, to, to keep in touch with each other. Um, but what messaging really allowed us to do was to provide kind of a text messaging platform uh, for the ship. It's not really a text, it's more of a chat kind of thing. Um, doesn't require any charge, it's free. Um, that was a key driver from our president is that it should be free, and which I love. Um, so now passengers don't have to bring walkie-talkies on board, they can just connect to this system, uh, use it free, freely. Um, they can use it in a passive manner, uh, where it's more like leaving a note in a box. Uh, there's an app they can download additionally that, that will give them notifications. Uh, but this is all driven by Drupal. So, uh, you know, the, the app is native. It's there just to capture that uh, device ID and be able to push the notifications out. Um, but, you know, it's been a kind of a challenge getting this one out because there's a lot of things to think about we, when you're activating notifications on a, on a kind of a closed network. Um, uh, so it, it's been tricky, but it's been, apart from the notification part, the messaging itself has been kind of a transformative experience for the guests. Um, and for Princess, too, because like one of the cool things we now have is another channel to send messaging out directly to the guests. Uh, previously, we'd have to make an announcement over the ship's loudspeakers uh, if there was immigration coming up or uh, change in venue. The cruise director likes to get on there and hear his own voice a lot of times, you know. Um, but we're now able to send these kind of things uh, through the system. 
uh, and out directly to the passengers and even potentially in the future target specific passengers themselves with specific kind of messaging as well. Um, and, and one of the kind of the cool things that uh, that allows too is kind of like corralling your group. You know, the, the sys it's not just a one-to-one -one communication. It can be a one-to-many uh, kind of thing where, you, where groups themselves can, can chat. Um, and one of, you know, the kind of why this even came into being is that socializing the ship is actually a very important thing on a cruise. It's why there's traditional dining where you have a large table with multiple guests who are on different, uh, you know, in different staterooms, may not know each other. The idea is that you meet new people and meet new friends. Uh, so we didn't want to have that only tied to that one time you have dinner or those times you have dinner with them. So when you meet them, you can uh, become contacts with them and messaging and then now have uh, more people that you can plan events for through the rest of the cruise. And one of the kind of cool things uh, about this whole infrastructure here is that we've been able to leverage it for a lot of other features. So we have charters and large groups coming uh, on board quite a bit. Uh, and this now gives them a way to, instead of having, they actually have like big flip charts like the ones you see here in a table set up. Uh, to coordinate all their people on the charter or on the group. Now they can use a group, large group messaging that's automatically set up for them. They have kind of their own space and wall within Bridges at Sea to, uh, to manage and, and uh, provide a great experience for their customers who are their uh, members of their charter. So this was taken on Sapphire Princess last year. Um, off the coast of Korea. Uh, it was, I got up at insanely early hour one morning for some reason and took this photo. Um, but I like it because it makes me think about the future. Um, so what we have now is really just the beginning, the start of what we're doing. It's all revolves around what we've been able to do with Drupal and the way we've been able to use a lot of the contributed module space and uh, a lot of the great service providers that have sprung up around Drupal. Um, so we're planning a lot of really kind of cool features. We really want to extend kind of this sharing concept beyond just the ship and out to uh, the world itself and your, you know, your real group of friends uh, back home. So we're looking at ways we can integrate social into this. Uh, we definitely want to get into more transaction stuff that's coming very quickly down the pipe. Um, we've been experimenting a lot with ways we can do, you know, kind of location aware on board the ship. Uh, we can't really rely on GPS because you're moving constantly. So uh, we have to look at interesting other ways to do that. Uh, and we, like one of the key things for us is as we get more and more information about the passengers, uh, we're on a very space constrained device. Uh, we need to be able to uh, provide more relevant information to the passenger in a, uh, w without throwing too many things at them at once. So we're looking at all sorts of ways we can do that. Of course, all of these are made only the more fun and challenging by being on a ship out in the middle of the ocean that can't use any cloud service. So, so the challenge that we have is like Drupal itself is powering digital signages, video on demand systems, and everything. Like, and our primary use case is also the passengers and our personal devices. And we have, we do too many things like e-commerce, uh, like we have messaging, we have information, we have everything into one tiny screen. So we want to build more intelligence towards it so that you know, when the passenger uh, looks at his uh, like profile, you know, he, he gets what he needs to have. But we have real-time engine, decision engines uh, running around, like you know, we have it here, but it's getting to work on board the ship is a big challenge. We're working towards it. So if there's one thing, though, that this entire project up to this point has uh, taught us is that Drupal really is a platform for making platforms. Um, it's very, very flexible. Uh, it's geared towards what we want to do, which is be digital and cause these digital transformations. And therefore, Drupal is digital. Going back to like what Dree said at that keynote two years ago, um, really resonated with us. Uh, and the direction we're heading. And by the way, this was taken off of Japan 
as the sun was setting, and I just thought it was nice that this is the way the land of the rising sun says goodbye to you, uh, is by the sun setting on a beautiful ocean. So thank you very much for uh, listening to me yammer on for 45 minutes. You're not um, yet. Yeah. A couple notes, though. We do want to do some questions, and we're going to bribe you with some giveaways. Uh, so whoever answer, asks a question will get an umbrella or a cookbook, princess cookbook. So it's branded. Um, but two notes. Uh, we are hiring. Uh, so please, if you or anyone you know, uh, you know, is thinking about working at somewhere kind of cool and weird and fun, um, stop by our booth. Um, I'm there quite often. Um, actually, uh, Cebu will be there quite often. A lot of people from our team are there, so we love talking about the project and what we're doing and finding people that will mesh really well with the team that we have. Uh, one other note, and this is definitely one that you should uh, plan on attending. Um, we're doing, uh, Lingotech has graciously invited us to their booth tomorrow for a couple hours for a uh, session, well it's not really a session, it's more of a beer drinking kind of fun <laughs> Q&A kind of thing uh, called Beers, Boats and Booths. It's tomorrow uh, from 3 to 5 at Lingotech's booth, which is uh, booth number 806. So definitely mark that on your calendars. There's going to be some cool swag you can get and all that. Uh, while we do questions, just one note, please leave feedback for us uh, on what you think of the session. Was it helpful? Was it cool? Was it terrible? leave it all. So let's uh, get started with the questions. Great presentation. Thanks. What do you guys do to disseminate user logins? Does each fan have in one login or does each person have it? How do they get access to the bills, etc.? Sure. So right now um, the user logins are tied with their um, uh, uh, booking on board the ship. So it's directly tied into their shipboard account. Uh, we are going to be integrating that with our princess.com login in the near future, so it'll be a one-time persistent, um, only one login, single login. Right now, though, it's it's really just there for use when you're on the ship, um, and when you leave it, you lose everything that uh, you set up on the ship. That's something we really want to change. So, like, contacts you create on the ship will follow you around, all of these things. So, so if you have a family with, like, four kids, for example, do they all get their own logins? Yes, yeah. So it is unique per person, and that's mainly because of the billing, the way the billing is done. Um, basically, everybody in a stateroom can be charging to one card, or there can be multiple cards. So there's kind of this layering of who gets to see what parts of the bill and all that stuff. The owner of the card always gets to see everything. The users who are underneath it get to see bits and pieces. Um, so everybody has their own specific login uh, tied to their kind of loyalty number um, that everyone gets when they when they take a cruise with us. Thank you. Cool. You Come like and uh, get a book or an umbrella. Oh. We only have two umbrellas, so you know, if you want an umbrella, yeah. run up and ask a question. Okay. One's right. Yeah. <laughs> now you're set for the five times it rains in LA. Hopefully you're from a rainy area. Yeah. Uh, cool. All right, I have a couple questions. Um, first, so if a cruise director or the powers that be need to add an event, change an event, whatever, there's, are they logging into a local instance of Drupal and, and as soon as they add that event, it gets published? Or is it a thing, you were saying it goes back to stateside and, and there's some kind of sure. approval system or something and then comes back to the ship? Like how do, what's that process? So there's kind of two things. There's <clears throat> two systems in play and kind of two parts to it. Um, there is a separate scheduling system that they use that does directly tie to us for all the titles and descriptions of events. Mm -hmm. um, that populates us, and then we have the uh, ability to override or create additional ones in Prince of the in Drupal. Um, those are all content types. That's a node that's being created mm -hmm. at that point. Um, the actual title, description, images, all that stuff, those are all taxonomy terms. So they, while they create their own events, and they can do that on demand, publish immediately. Okay. They have a limited subset of function functionality they can do on um, uh, the terms themselves. So there's, you know, the shore side approved terms, which are locked down, they can't even touch. They can look at them and browse them. They can create new terms, which they can publish immediately. Uh, 
because the nature of the ship, they may have guest entertainers change, all that stuff, so we have to give them some flexibility there. Uh, but those will, once they create it, in the background it does come back shoreside. We can do our own editing workflow, republish it back out, and override whatever they had with the corporate approved branding. Mm. Um, so it's kind of a mix of both. Mm. Okay. So once it comes back, it also goes to Lingard again, gets translated. So if the event is good for, one ship creates an event, and uh, the corporate thinks that it's good for every ship, uh, it'll go for translation and then it gets streamed out to all the other ships for the library on, the, on those ships. Okay. And then uh, the other question is, so you have the, the billing system, I'm assuming, is not in Drupal. Right. So what, how do the two systems talk to each other? Are you using services? In, yeah. In we, um, we, uh, the rule we made early on for every system that was either going to look at us or that we were going to look at was everything had to be RESTful JSON. Um, there was, we've, believe me, we've had many other uh, systems ask to have direct access to the uh, database, right. um, which we've denied every time. I always use the excuse, you don't want to figure out how Drupal is storing all this stuff in the database, and I don't really want right. to explain it to you either. So just, you know, we'll create a service, it'll give you what you need, you create a service to us, and we can all agree to that, you know, then if, say, God forbid, one day we do switch to something else, we can have the service look identical. Mm -hmm. um, and not break any of the functionality. And you're literally using the services module or are you using something homegrown or? Like um, so for other? us, we do use services module. Okay. Um, so everything we do, uh, we built custom services for. Okay. Um, the other systems are using their own stuff. It's a mix of um, yeah, what is the back Lotus end? stuff, like, oh, okay, uh, yeah. Lotus Notes stuff, if you oh, believe okay. it. That's where the wow. event scheduling okay. system is in. <laughs> um, <Wow. laughs> there's Java stuff out there, there's some .NET sprinkled in there. Um, Mainframe COBOL. Yeah, we don't talk to them very, yet. very often. Yeah. Okay. We sit right next to them, but they're a quiet bunch. <laughs> yeah. Cool, yeah, that's all I had. Cool, if you want a book or an umbrella, please come. It's a cookbook from the ship. Yeah, the, the cookbooks, by the way, are, are all uh, stuff that they serve on board the ships. So, you know, give you a taste of Princess at home. Um, Yes. I'm new to Drupal. I just know I've been in IT for a while, but new to Drupal. I noticed you have 15, 20, 25 different modules that are not Drupal plugged in. What process did you go through to decide which ones to use? Um, that's a good question. There's ones that we always use, um, some core ones that we always, no matter what project we're doing in Drupal, we use. There's, you know, activating multilingual uh, and languages adds quite a few. Um, we tend to look at quite a few things. One, we do review the code uh, of the module that we're looking at adding, just to make sure that it fits the kind of, that we're not uncomfortable with anything. We always look at how many sites have installed that module, when the last commit date was, how many issues it has in its issue queue. All this stuff is, it's great on Drupal.org because you can see all this stuff very easy, it's very transparent. So we, we look at all of those things, mainly to determine is this actively supported and uh, is it actively being developed? And, you know, there is a line in there that says whether it's actively being developed or maintained or it's abandoned or, you know, looking for a new maintainer, et cetera. Okay. So, Drupal.org, that's the, the key okay. thing. Okay, thank you. Hi. Hello. I'd be interested to know if you did any sort of user testing, awesome. first of all, or if the first ship it went live on, were they the first people using it, or how much did you test it out before? Um, the answer is uh, none. Um, okay. <laughs> it, uh, uh, the timeline was really tight for Royal Princess. It was a very, very basic site at that time. Mm -hmm. It was, um, pattern-wise, we weren't doing anything too, felt, felt too crazy. Um, we also didn't really have, it had to roll out when the new ship rolled out, and no other ships really at that time uh, had the Wi-Fi coverage that we really needed, so we so really just, it was kind of rolling the dice, you know, I mean, we knew that it was going to work, we knew passengers was, were going to like it, but we, we didn't really know. We've done more, um, we do look at feedback, there, there's a very, very active cruise community out there called Cruise Critic. Um, if you do something wrong, you're going to see it on there in about five seconds. Uh, so we look at that. We, we've started doing informal uh, passenger focus groups as we do deployments, but it's 
something we lack right now that we really want to um, make it a more formalized part of our process. Would that be something that you would expect them, like if they give passengers give feedback on the ship, or do you like send them a survey and hope they get back to you? Um, so we do it, we like to do it directly on the ship because it's in the environment. Um, it's a, I think you'd look at the thing differently when you're in the moment versus not, but when, you know, if it's usable or not, it can be done at any point, you know, mm -hmm. um, and you'd, that's one of the things we're, we're convincing everyone right now is you don't need a large group to get good results. Right. Um, uh, we haven't really determined how we're going to, you know, our methodology for that yet. Um, there, we're going to try and leverage some of the stuff that our princess.com team is using um, and see how we can extend it even further um, and go from there. So it's still evolving, you know, uh, kind of a not totally uh, succinct answer, but uh, That's great. cool. All right, thank you. Okay, we're, uh, we've got three things left, so the three people in the uh, <laughs> line, so you're all good. Hey, thanks again for the presentation. Um, I apologize if I missed the first couple of minutes, but some of the screenshots were confusing. The passengers, do they access this through a web browser or through an uh, app? Yeah, so it is all browser-based. Okay. Uh, we, we made that decision very early on because we didn't, you know, it costs money to connect to the app stores and download it yeah. Um, yeah. for the internet, really, more than anything. So we yeah. didn't want somebody to have to remember to do something before they got on Exactly, board. perfect. Okay, great. Yeah. And then also it's just it's just hosted locally on the ship, right? Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it doesn't, it's not affected by internet outages, any of yeah. that stuff. And so yeah. that kind of leads into my next question, which is about the future. I mean, is the globe going to get more coverage? Is that something you guys are thinking about as far as like, is the internet going to be available in the middle of the ocean someday? Uh, yeah, the, yeah. So we are looking at ways we can do it. The, luckily, the majority of our cruises don't go more than like 50 miles off the coast. Okay. Um, so there's, I know there's some stuff that are actively being deployed right now to, um, you know, we, we're not Royal Caribbean who can do, you know, spend billions of dollars on, on their uh, internet infrastructure, so uh, we're looking at smarter ways we can spend uh, a smaller amount of money to uh, to do that. So we're looking at stuff that's more land-based is one that's rolled out in Alaska already, um, and working with our satellite providers to you know to optimize the bandwidth we have right now. Yeah, because I mean it seems to make sense to, to you know host it on the ship, and, you know it's always reliable, but. I'm just wondering about, you know, you've had to overcome so many challenges with the fact that the internet isn't available in, on a cruise. Yeah. I'm wondering if it'll um, improve your processes if, you know, internet becomes available. Yeah, you know. yeah, and really, then that's the thing. Like, we do have, not, you know, it is available the majority of the time. So mm -hmm. it's not, it just may not be great. Is exactly. All, you know, um, so luckily Drupal zips up pretty small, you know, so when yeah. we need to deploy the code, it's, it's not, you know, gigantic. Um, uh, so we, we're not faced with some of the same challenges that other other teams are. Um, it's still, you know, it's one of those things we don't have a good solution for yet, though. Mm -hmm. You know, real high speed kind yeah. of internet access. And uh, I might have missed this too. I'm sorry, but like, how do they access? Do they just open their browser and it's like when you're at a hotel, it just kind of takes over? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, it's so it's it's just like a hotel. We have a captive portal on board. Mm -hmm. You connect to the the passenger Wi-Fi. Yeah. Uh, and any request you make is going to redirect you to us. Awesome. Thanks, so. guys. Cool. We also made the domain really easy, by the way. So we have princess.com, so every site that runs on the ship is the ship name. So royal.princess.com or sapphire.princess.com and so on. So. Hi. So um, it was implied. I just wanted to clarify. You have no technical staff on board to maintain these systems. Right. So we do have a IT officer who well, they, there is an but IT. they are more of a uh, support person for computer stuff more than uh, a server, somebody who might understand the server or understand Drupal or any of that stuff. We do have a content manager on board. Oh, you do. Uh, okay. So they manage content purely, but they're not really a developer. Um, so everything we do, we have to be able to to remotely support. So do you have a remote data center and a sense of what kind of tools you use out of that data center? Yeah, yeah, so I mean we do have, there is, it's a, I wouldn't say it's beefy, but there is a, a nice sized data center on board. Uh, uh, and, no, I um, meant remotely. 
Hmm? Where is your, you have a central? Yes, yeah, so we, we have our own data center here in uh, Los Angeles, I think it's replicated somewhere else too, but, okay. uh, but yeah, so we have, we have one here, we have a simulation of the ship data center here too. It uh, doesn't unfortunately cover the full in the end. We don't have the full passenger Wi-Fi kind of simulation in our office, which has led to some, you know, snafus here and there. But uh, uh, cool. Uh, I was wondering about um, specifically performance testing and what you do um, for perform, uh, you know, for performance testing. So we have a, a, a automated pipeline that so every commit goes automatically to dev. It also now it. it didn't do this in the past, but it's now triggering our test runs as well on every commit, basically. Uh, we use JMeter uh, in there. We use, what else we got? Uh, Sorry, page speed or something, site Sorry, speed. Um, um, yeah. 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 And Is there anything specifically in your code that you focus on to, uh, you know, make your, make the site more efficient? Um, I'm not sure what sort of constraints you have based on like the ship's server architecture. If there's differences there, I'm yeah, sure we I'm actually sure. we actually don't have to worry about it too much. We have a you know we're the max we're going to have is 4,000 people on at, yeah. you know on there, and um, we haven't had to really optimize it too much to make it run well. Yeah. I mean, we don't we barely use caching <laughs> whatsoever on board because it's not an issue for us. Right. You know, we have a fairly decent sized VM, so we don't have to worry too much about it. Um, more than anything, it's a memory problem more that we run into more than anything. Yeah. Uh, and cool, again, thanks. Recovery yeah. from uh, any failure, I mean, that's what we had to look at more than performance. Right. It's more predictability. Yeah, it makes sense.